is going to cause massive congestion, massive pollution. Have you looked at the costs of owning the Emirates, not only in carbon congestion, lost time, loss of business and property blight? Can you please address that? Okay. Um, I'll try and uh, bring those questions together to some of the, uh, to the, to some of the panel. Uh, Martin, so Karen and Liz then both made, I think, connected points. Karen was talking about, I, I think, with glossing her question that we're effectively we're, we're shipping jobs to London instead of building a sustainable local economy. And Liz talked about the huge disruption and congestion that would be caused by the construction of the project over many years. Well, I'm not totally sure that we are shipping jobs to London, but even if we are, mm. even if we are, then, and they live here, where are they spending their money? Where are they bringing their economic benefit to? Um, I don't necessarily agree with the, <laughs> agree with the premise of the question, but um, I, I don't think want to add any more to that. I mean, Jim might be able to uh, back that one up from a, 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 a transport analysis perspective. It's, it's certainly not something that I've, uh, that I've studied, I have to say. Uh, in terms of uh, Lizzie, some good points there. Um, property blight. Uh, well, there's, there is a scheme for property blight that the government will address that. No, you're right, there's not for businesses, and I have to say that was a point that uh, when I did my response to the AHS when I was uh, before I was with WSB, when I was with the NZ, it was a point I suggested that was, uh, that was referred to. So I think it's a valid point, and you know, the, the, the Birmingham Chamber Transport Group that I'm here representing tonight are not giving this government a total point check on all of these things, and these things do need to be thought about. So I wouldn't uh, disagree with that. I haven't done any analysis on it. It's not my job. It's not my specialist skill. So I'm not going to try and fob you off with some fancy analysis. In terms of 15 years of disruption, I don't think we are going to have 15 years of disruption. It's not 15 years build program. Um, and I have to say, having lived through um, numerous uh, uh, disruptions of the, uh, the motorways around the M42, um, you know. They do a pretty, the, today's engineers do a pretty good job of keeping things moving. They don't switch a uh, whole um, transport system down to build these things. When, they, when we did the West Coast up, up they catch up, uh, yes, that was a problem because we were losing a whole transport network for uh, 48 hours of, of weekends and longer on that holiday weekends. But I, I'm not as pessimistic as you. I understand the points and I, you know, it, it has. Uh, a great deal of validity. In terms of Birmingham, the bulk of the work in the city centre is going to be on current uh, brownfield sites at the moment anyway. Um, and um, the, uh, the transport corridors down through are, are, are reasonably uh, well separated from uh, fundamental uh, transport corridors. I don't think there's going to be massive disruption to our motorway network. Can I, uh, can I ask, um, uh, Mike, given that you know, we're told that there will be economic benefits, obviously the two speakers uh, are disputing that, but supposedly economic benefits to the West Midlands. Roger made the point as well about the current congestion is on the network, and he said, you know, if you're a nimble, he's not going to change your mind, but anybody else in the arguments would surely back in. So I suppose you are the token nimble. I thought when uh, the NHS2 proposal first came up that uh, there might be a choice about whether to be an MB or not. That's not the case. The arguments against NHS2 are so strong that uh, you know, the, the NIMB issue really is, is not the crucial issue. We are, of course, condemned as NIMBYs by uh, Philip Hammond on a regular basis. Um, but I think that is really is a side issue. If I go to the uh, points that the, the gentleman was making about current congestion, that is one of the key points. And what we're finding, I think, is that the proponents of HS2 are having to ignore what could be done in the short term, relatively quickly, to deal with those current problems of congestion that we face in order to make the case for HS2. And HS2 will not be here till 2026 at the earliest. 
So if we take you seriously on those issues, HS2 is not the answer. It can't be the answer. We have to look seriously at what we can do in the here and now. On the jobs issue, it is notable that uh, Philip Hammond, in what he says, and the, uh, the paper, the documents produced for the consultation, continue to argue that there will be big jobs benefits, and in particular, to take up the issue about sustainable local and regional economies, that, that uh, uh, high-speed rail will uh, rebalance the economy away from London towards the Midlands and the North. In fact, the only figures produced in the consultation documents show precisely the reverse of that. So there is no way that we can take Hammond's arguments at, uh, at face value. They just do not stack up. There have been figures produced by Green Gage, for example, or for KPMG by, uh, uh, by KPMG for Green Gage, which appear to show the reverse. I feel very sure that if the government <coughs> felt that those figures were credible figures, it would be using them. It's not using them. We have to draw our own conclusions from that. So on jobs, the numbers of jobs for Birmingham will be very small indeed. The cost per job will be astronomically high. If you want to create jobs, the last thing you do is build a high-speed railway. There are many other ways of creating jobs than that. Which was about the, the validity of, of the forecast as well. Uh, yes, well, I mean, I can only really uh, agree with that. Uh, you know, just because there has been 70% growth on the railways over the last uh, 15 years doesn't mean there's going to be anything like that over the next. I mean, it's historically, it's quite uh, an unprecedented period. Uh, yes, there is some uh, uh, push factors uh, towards the railway, such as the price of uh, fuel. And yes, there's some pull factors in that uh, railway services have improved, and uh, particularly on the West Coast Main Line they've improved, which is why you know, the figures have uh, uh, been so positive there. But merely to extrapolate that and suggest that you know, that's going to continue and we have to accommodate that demand, I think is very questionable. And that accommodating demand is a very interesting point. Predict and provide has been largely abandoned for most other forms of travel. You know, even for uh, uh, aeroplanes, you know, at one point the previous government had a predict and provide idea that would build as much airport capacity in the southeast as uh, was demanded by all these people wanting to go off uh, to Riga uh, uh, for stag parties. And then they decided, well, actually, uh, the new government decided, no, it can't do that, it's not building any new uh, runways in the southeast. So predictive providers gone. Predictive providers gone on the roads uh, because uh, you know we the, the, the public won't put up with it. Basically, you know we will, the public will not put up with massive amounts of new roads. So why should we do that in terms of railways? As I said, I love the railways. I you know I like the fact that the railways have been booming, but I don't think this is the right thing to do to accommodate that growth. <laughs> Well, I don't think there's much more really to be said on the forecast. The forecast, uh, in my view, uh, are, um, uh, thanks, Chris, uh, are, um, are modest, um, and they're certainly not based simply on trend extrapolation. Now, there's two points I just wanted to make. To pick up on Roger's point about congestion and uh, really Mike's response to that, which is, oh, well, you're, you're having to ignore tackling that in order to protect the case of the HS2. Well, I, I think that's a little harsh. If you look at the work that's been done, the background assumption is that there is a lengthening of trains, for instance, to accommodate growth in the meantime. It's just a limit to the extent you can do that. You could argue, certainly, and I would support you, uh, or those who say this, that uh, there should be more lengthening of local trains in the West Midlands. It's something that uh, Centre has been arguing for, I think, the deadline to, to keep on hammering the point because so far it's not forthcoming. But in general, that's going to have to be the answer until we can find a way to fit more trains on the network. Um, but I'd like to just pick up, if I may, on um, 
But Carolyn's point this is an extremely important one she raises about the uh, reliance on better connectivity and the question about whether this really is going to help the, the balance in, in the economy. A couple of points on this, if I may. The first is that the, the objective that clearly the coalition government has set exists in its set nature to it as a prime minister. He said, no less. He said, well, I want to rebalance the economy away from the overheated southeast and away from concentration on financial services, uh, which, personally, and I suspect many people would agree, would be a good thing. He thinks high speed two is going to help achieve that. Why does he think it will do? Why does the CBI, for instance, support that? And if you ask them, they say, well, because everybody in the North and the Midlands say, well, maybe not all, but the business community in general says, I want this. It's going to help me. It's going to help me with the kind of things that we're talking about in expanding the regional economy. All of the core cities say they want it. If you talk to, develop, to de developers um, about where they're going to locate their next big project in Britain, they'll say, well, I'm going to be on the M25. Look at where the development community is active now. If you go to London, find there are cranes in the skyline and they're active and the property market is booming. It isn't, I have to say, in any provincial city. Now you might be right that improving connectivity won't overcome. But I would say you've got to give it a chance. You have to try to get the, the cities outside the southeast with some of the advantages that London has got. Otherwise we certainly are in for a continuing two-tier economy. And I believe, personally, that in terms of sustainability, you have real choices in transport. And governments made some of those choices. It won't say this too loudly, because people like Paul Witherington will get very upset. They've chosen not to expand the road network. They've chosen this government not to expand the air capacity where it's most needed, which is in South East. They've decided they will look at the demand for additional rail uh, travel, which actually to a very large degree stems simply from capping the ability of every other transport mode to cope with totally foreseeable increases in demand over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Why bother to accommodate that? Well, in my view, because it's the most sustainable thing to do. Why is it? Because it helps cities Every other transport investment other than this will have the impact, like it or not, in the long term of encouraging sprawl, suburbanisation, actually loss of interest. I know it's not an immediate impact, but that's what we're about. Okay, Jim. Uh, thank you. Uh, final round of questions. So if you defer to the chair, and uh, uh, then you'll burst in. <laughs> so I'll take a final round of questions from the gentleman at the front, uh, the gentleman with the black jacket there, and the chap in the salmon pink uh, shirt. Uh, Don't I get it? Sorry? Don't I get it? No. Um, <laughs> so, if the, have, you, have you got those spotted there? There's the, there's the chap there and the chap there. I'm sorry if I didn't get everybody on, but such a slide on that part of that Thank you, Adrian. Uh, my, my question is for Mr. Steer. Sorry, what's your name, please, sir? Uh, Morton. Um, with regard to Mr. Cameron, I think in fairness, he's only just finding out the implications.